Well, good morning, everybody. On behalf of Millbrook Christian Center and ICJ, we welcome you this morning. Uh, we believe you will have a blessed day today, and we just pray the Lord's blessing and hand on today's conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Yes, well, blessings to you all. As uh, my sister, the back, was saying, you know, it's nearly three years now, isn't it, since we were uh, able to meet. But praise God, here we are through the grace and the mercy of the Lord. Now, it's great to um, once again just be sharing our wonderful message about the ministry of the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. I want to tell you about some very positive developments that have taken place even during the lockdown. And it's wonderful to know, isn't it, when everything's against you, but if God be for you, who can be against you? And we're very thrilled that Paul and Nola, would you like to stand up, Paul and Nola, let's give them a welcome. <laughs> very precious friends, we've been uh, friends now for 40 year, over 40 years. Remarkable story of how we all met and everything else. And uh, they were actually at uh, my church in uh, Liverpool uh, just a few weeks ago, and what a mighty blessing that was. Um, and so I'm quite sure there's a new and a fresh anointing of new oil uh, for this meeting. And for this is our second regional conference since the lockdown um, ended. So here you are as pioneers, and you're going to see a breakthrough. Yes. And the Lord is going to make a way where there is no way. Now, I know many of you know uh, bits of Hebrew, some of you very well, but there's a wonderful word meaning thank you. And can anyone tell me what that is in Hebrew? Tada, there we go, and you, you'd know that. But you know, in the Bible, it's actually translated, certainly in Leviticus, to mean thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, thank you to one another. When somebody gives you a cup of coffee or a hug, Later on, it's a todder. But biblically, it's more it's thanksgiving. And of course, thanksgiving is not just to the person. It's always towards the Lord. And so it's todder that we meet with today. Thanksgiving to God that he's brought us through this difficult time when many, of course, didn't uh, m make it. Uh, many more people are still very anxious and fearful. But God is with us, and we give him thanks that his hand is upon our life. And he gave us a wonderful promise, our wonderful Messiah, our Mashiach, that he would never leave us and never forsake us, no matter what is going on, no matter what is going on in this world, we can have trust and complete confidence in him. Blessed be the name of the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And so I'm just going to hand over now to our worship band. This is great that they are able to travel around the different regions, again, which I'll be mentioning, led by Steve Goodall here, and uh, we've got Lydia and Steve over there, uh, yes, I haven't forgotten James, and uh, nor have I forgotten Chris, <laughs> and our Josh, <laughs> this is our grandson. <laughs> <laughs> Clap for everyone there. <laughs> And this is my wife, by the way. She likes to stand up, Gwen. Some of you don't see her. Oh, no. <laughs> we don't let her out very often, but because of the lockdown, I thought I'd bring her. <laughs> Shall we just pray and give our time to the Lord? Our Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thine outstretched arm. And there's nothing that is too difficult for thee. And we come to you, Lord, with thanksgiving in our hearts. And Lord, we meet today not just to have a meeting, but to have an encounter with the living God. Lord, we want to hear and listen to what you are saying and doing, Lord, in Israel, in these days. And we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, will just fill each person and fill this place. And Lord, especially we bring our dear brother Mark before you. We just ask, Lord, for your healing hand to be upon him, Lord God. And Lord, for any who are sick, Lord, again, you are the Lord that heals us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, now 
for your wonderful plan. You have a plan for each individual life. But Lord, you have a plan, Lord, for Israel and through Israel for the whole world. For our redemption is drawing nigh and we lift up our heads and we see great things happening. And Lord God, as we give you the glory, as we give you this thanksgiving now, Lord, may you truly inhabit the praises of your people. In the wonderful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray these things. Amen. It gives us a foretaste of what it's like to worship the Lord in Jerusalem, in the land of Israel. And of course, I see Jay's whole ministry centered around the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, in fact, we we're the first Christian group in the land to really begin to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, that has gone to such uh, proportions. In fact, Jürgen Buller, who you uh, see on video shortly, who's the president of ICJ, he uh, was telling us at one of our last uh, leaders' uh, gatherings together how the minister of tourism, they were talking about tabernacles. And he said, you Christians, you really messed up our feast. And Jürgen said, what do you mean? He said, well, it used to be a nice, quiet feast. <laughs> he said, you could get into hotels. And <laughs> he said, but since you lot came. <laughs> and uh, it's quite wonderful for there to be 5,000 people from all nations. They have about uh, branches in nearly 90 nations of the world uh, in Jerusalem, worshiping God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. And I'm especially grateful, I don't know if I've told this story, but blessed be the name of the Lord, of course it was in 2017, I was just getting ready for the Feast of Tabernacles, and I had this massive aneurysm. Um, and uh, well, thank God my wife was around, and also that I wasn't on the aeroplane, which would have been three hours or so later. And down at the Dead Sea, there was a word of knowledge about a, a person uh, who was playing a significant part in the ministry. And uh, Jürgen said, I know who that is. Uh, the guy who gave the word, he was from South America. He didn't know me. He was just an invited uh, speaker uh, for the particular feast in that year. Anyway, they just all prayed for me. So it's not many people can say they had 5,000 people down at the Dead Sea praying for them. <laughs> And then obviously family and friends and church here. And here I am. <laughs> Praise God. And Martha said I look quite good. So <laughs> blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> and our God is a mighty God. And um, what I would like to do now, I want to just give you a little bit of an overview of what has been happening with our ministry uh, within the UK uh, during the lockdown. And particularly during uh, this um, last season and I mentioned a little bit earlier this is actually uh, our second regional conference the first one was in Billinge near Wigan uh, where James our uh, lead guitarist is uh, from but uh, and Mike Kerry is, uh, was the pastor there for many years he's a right hand man in, in, in the work and of course that's where our office is so if you write to ICJ UK you'll be put in contact with Joanne, uh, our administrator in the office in Billinge. <clears throat> now, um, many charities and not-for-profit organizations have found things very difficult during the lockdown. But I'm very pleased to report to you that ICJ UK has much to thank God for. We've found that during this last couple of years, our ministry has not plummeted it's actually just increased from strength to strength. And we do, we do indeed give thanks uh, to God for this. <clears throat> we give thanks to Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God Almighty, who we've sung about and just prayed to. And I believe the key to, to the blessing began uh, when Jerusalem was sharing with the different uh, regional leaders and so on of what God had put on their hearts and they felt we cannot meet, we can't have a, a feast of tabernacles for the first time in over 40 years physically in the land. What are we going to do? And the first thing that happened and the first thing that should happen for every believer in every situation is that you need to seek God. 
And as they began to pray, the vision just began to form very clearly. We have a wonderful uh, prayer ministry in Jerusalem. And uh, Josh, a young man who heads up that meeting uh, as well, this has just developed. It's just been wonderful to see uh, young people growing in the ministry. And uh, Josh Gooding now has got a wonderful team. Uh, we have a wonderful expansion even into um, Egypt. We now have, as, as Steve, I think, before spoke about the Messianic fellowships. We're really building relationships there. But we also have an incredible ministry into the Arab world, and particularly with Isaiah 19. Some of you will know that well. That is a ministry which believes that God is going to bring revival uh, from Egypt and right uh, throughout, because that's what the Word of God says. Isn't that in incredible? And uh, well, anyway, I, I won't speak about that uh, ministry too much. Maybe uh, I'll say a little bit more in our prayer session a little bit later on. But what I do want to say is the result of it in uh, many of the nations to start with. <clears throat> we said, yes, we will pray together. We'll make a definite commitment to prayer. And the prayer time has taken place at what is called Rosh Kadesh. Literally, that means the head of the month. In other words, the beginning of the month. And uh, if you don't know, the Jewish months are different to our months. <clears throat> and so it doesn't begin on the first of our month. So you have to get a little bit used to the dates and the seasons. And incidentally, I, I think that is important when a lot of prophetic stuff is uh, given out. And they give it out on the basis of the Gregorian calendar, the Western calendar. And I often think, hmm, I wonder if this ties in <laughs> with the Hebraic calendar. And I know who wrote that one. <laughs> anyway, that's another story for another day. Um, <clears throat> And what happened was there was a, a real agreement, yes, this is a good way to meet, and a word which none of us knew then, and which everybody knows now, is called Zoom. <laughs> it's like the word tsunami, isn't it? You know, a few years ago, nobody had a clue what a tsunami was. <laughs> and now we, uh, we hear, sadly, about too many of them. But this uh, Zoom which can be a blessing and also, um, well, I won't say a curse, but it can be extremely demanding. And uh, now there are many people who are Zoomed out. <laughs> but uh, I, I do want to say for us uh, within ICJ, internationally, that this Rosh Kodesh prayer on Zoom has been absolutely amazing. Absolutely. And it's a wonderful experience to start. We have the group over in South America, and it just travels right throughout the world. And one group passes on the prayer baton. At first it was for an hour. And now the nations have gone to two hours. And they're hoping that we'll be praying throughout the week. In all the nations passing it on. And uh, Steve and Lydia have been part of the wonderful worship that we have within uh, the UK. Uh, Paul and Nula I know have been involved with the Irish uh, branch. <coughs> Uh, are there. But it's wonderful when you come to the end of the time and then you just pass it on to Canada or you pass it on to New Zealand or the Fiji Islands or, or whatever. And that sense of identity is bringing people together. Now this is not uh, an exclusive club for just a, a few people. Our vision within the UK and internationally is that we want everyone to be involved. And what we uh, do is we allocate about f five minutes to each person and just say, well, look, look, please don't go over that time. Of course, being good uh, preachers and whatnot, I always do, you know. But <laughs> uh, no, we do try and stick to it quite uh, rigidly. Maybe when our prayer gathering takes place later on, we can keep this in mind. And so people are praying and then they're inviting their friends and people are hearing about it. Now, you can actually view this or give you, or we can get you some links so you can view it. But better still, why don't you consider joining us? It's a wonderful way in the um, privacy of your own home and yet that sense of corporateness, that you belong to the whole body of Christ. And I began this by just saying, you know, that prayer is so important. And when for ICJ there was this international lockdown, and nothing could happen in uh, Jerusalem. 
Now, if you consider it, you know, most of our funding and everything else takes place from the Feast of Tabernacles. So there was, there was no income. And obviously the same, naturally speaking, for us within the UK. But I'm going to tell you, miracles have happened. Miracles in Jerusalem, miracles in the UK. And we have never had such provision that's been given to us. Jehovah Jireh is our provider. It could only be God. <laughs> and it can only be God when people, if my people, will humble themselves, seek my face, pray. It promises us that he'll hear from heaven. So, um, as a, a development of that, with, again within the UK, uh, we've been blessed with a number of gifted intercessors um, for personal reasons. They, they couldn't be with us, some of them couldn't be with us uh, today. But it's great that we now have our own intercessory team headed up by Gordon and Karen Beatty. And uh, God just had them waiting in the wings. <laughs> and again, because of lockdown, our paths crossed. They were seeking God about where God wanted them. I met them. We just joined. Just, you know when you just meet someone you know, you're just one in the spirit. And they just felt so joined to the ministry and so much a part of it. And now it's just such a great blessing, isn't it, Steve, just to, to have this and have such wonderful people. So who knows what God is speaking to you about? You know, we don't just want to sort of have you here today just uh, listening to information and even being just blessed by the worship, which we have been. But we want you to hear what God is saying to you. Because, you know, this place should be full of people who've got an understanding or want to have an understanding about Israel. And this is a big challenge in the UK. You know, I, I meet with a lot of uh, uh, vicars in the course of uh, my own ministry in life. And boy, the hardness. And I know I'm probably speaking to the converted here that they just don't get it. They do not understand. They do not see the place and the plan and purpose that God has for Israel and above all for world redemption and the coming again of, of the Messiah. And so there's a battle on. And I want to see, and I know this is the longing of hearts here as well, we want to see young people really getting to grips with this. You know, in, in my personal ministry, I was 18 and, and my wife, we weren't married, but through a remarkable set of uh, circumstances, this man came to uh, my home before we were married, but obviously we were together um, going out and then one or two other people. And we just started a little meeting all those years ago. I said I was 18, so it would be about 10 years ago. So, so. <laughs> um, and anyway, this man uh, belonged to what was called the Barbican Mission to the Jews. And I had been, we'd been converted from uh, a sort of very middle of the road, dead Anglican position, and suddenly been filled with the Spirit and so on. And as we were just taught about the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, we just took it on board. And of course, one of the things we thought, because we were non-evangelicals up to that point, and non-charismatics, but we came in and we thought everyone within the evangelical world knew all this and what this, <laughs> what this uh, brother was teaching us, which was fascinating us. We were staggered to find that people just looked at you blankly, <laughs> uh, and that was evangelicals. And still to this day, as the years have passed by, it's my longing not just to reach my generation, our generation, but for the younger people to be as fired up as we were at 18. And I know that many people here, you know, you're not just uh, latecomers to this. You've had this revelation for years and years. And why was it it happened then? And it's not happening now in the UK, I hasten to add, because I could tell you many things are happening worldwide, even within our branches that are incredible with young people. Can God do it again here? Isn't this what we should be praying for and believing for? Lord, open eyes. Revive us again, Lord, in the midst of this generation. Anyway, um, oh, it's interesting as well. 
in, in Liverpool, which is our personal uh, base, where we're from, uh, we just have Franklin Graham. And uh, if he's, he's coming near you, you know, I'm not sure. You, you really do want to go. It's just been amazing, was not it? There were just thousands of people came. And the opposition that had been there, protesters outside saying he was a hate preacher and all this, that, and the other. And we had to be scanned as though you're going through the airport to go in to a meeting. It was not mentioned in the uh, local press. You know, you realize these are spiritual battles. This is spiritual battles. Anyway, that was, that was a, a wonderful time, and it was wonderful to see from generation, from his father to, to the son, uh, that ministry going on. And at the same time, and I think this started in Scotland, uh, my successor in the church, he is part, brought the church as part of this. Have you heard of this? Simple title, Try Praying. Try Praying. And... Um, all it is, you, you pray through for a, a week or so, and then you just give the book to someone else that you meet and you feel that God has put on your heart. And we have this big banner outside uh, of the church. And so people, we live not far off a main road, so people walking down, first thing that stands out to them, try praying. And all is said about Rosh Kadesh, for God's will for your life, try praying. Okay, men ought always to pray and not give up. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Anyway, um, during the early stages of the pandemic, the UK branch was blessed with being able to form a charitable arm in this country. Uh, this was something that previous expert charity advisors have told us uh, could not be done. <coughs> And uh, Michael will remember all of this. But we also know that with God, all things are possible. And we thank God that he's raised up and given uh, to the UK team some very gifted leaders on our board. <clears throat> and they carefully went through everything and drafted the charitable objects, which enabled us to include much of what we do within the terms of charitable status. And this includes conferences such as this, and, of course, our support for ICEJ aid. And if you remember, our mandate from Isaiah 40 is comfort, comfort ye my people, says you God. This was with ICEJ from the start, that we, we were called first and foremost to show that we're Christians by our love and practical help. Anyway, the benefits within the UK of this charitable status as some of you will know, but our supporters, in, give, if you can give, no cost yourself, it's 25% more that we can get from the inland revenue. Bless them, Lord. <laughs> and um, if you are a taxpayer, please consider this uh, in your giving. There are gift aid envelopes uh, around, and we want you to know uh, that, of course, whatever you give, well, I'm now going to tell you what that giving uh, goes towards. <clears throat> uh, Nicole Yodda, who has been with ICJ for um, many, many years, and she's a, a wonderful lady, a wonderful testimony. In fact, um, one of the things that we also have seen happening over the lockdown is that we've been a part of Revelation TV. And we have a program, which I'll mention a little bit later, every, every first Monday in the month. And also, we have a webinar interview uh, with Simon Barrett. And Simon Barrett, by the way, is also on board with the ministry for ICJ in the UK, and we bless God for that. And Nicole's story, um, you, you will hear on the uh, webinar that was last broadcast, and you can uh, catch that up on our UK, ICJ UK um, YouTube channel. Anyway, Nicole is the vice president of both Alia, which is, the, for those who don't know, the return of the Jews uh, to the land, <clears throat> and also for all the aid works in Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, Nicole uh, told us just uh, a month or so ago that uh, the UK had funded from a personal giving directly to Jerusalem the cost of half a bomb shelter, 
They haven't just built half a bomb shelter, by the way. <laughs> uh, but we provided half the cost, or people did from the UK. Um, <clears throat> now, this is in addition to two which we have fully supported from the UK, we've funded. <clears throat> now, this extra money was given by UK supporters directly to Jerusalem. And this, of course, is very laudable, and we thank God for that. But if the people who kindly given had uh, towards that uh, cost, if they'd actually sent it through the charity, we would have been able to receive another 25%, which again could have gone to paying for three quarters of a bomb shelter. <laughs> if my maths is a long time since I did maths, you know. But <laughs> anyway, so if you please would uh, just consider that with your giving. I'm going to go on to tell you in detail some of the incredible giving that's taken place. Uh, but we'll show you where all the designated funds go to uh, that, that's been sent in that way as we follow our biblical mandate uh, to comfort God's ancient people. And I think maybe this is a good point to have a little look at a video of Nicole and some of the work that she's doing and her, her gratitude towards you here in the UK. Hello friends, my name is Nicole Yoder and I'm the Vice President for Aid and Aliyah at the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. Today I'm speaking to you from the northern border of Israel in a special town called Ma'alot Tarshicha. You can see behind me in the distance the hills that surround. This is a very special community because it's a, a community of two mixed uh, Jewish and Arab communities. Ma'alot was a Jewish town and Tarshicha an Arab town and they decided to come together in one single municipality so it's a very mixed community of Bedouins and Druze and Muslims and Christians and immigrants from Russia and Ethiopia, really a microcosm of Israeli society. And what I want to talk to you today is about the challenges that communities along the borders of Israel face. This community is just a few kilometers from the border. And we've had the privilege this morning to be up here uh, delivering shelters and dedicating shelters from our Christian friends around the world that are going to provide protection for schools and kindergartens, uh, children in vulnerable areas. These children have a lot to deal with knowing that they live close to the border and any time an attack can happen where they need to run for shelter and literally they have maybe 15 seconds to reach that shelter. I want to say a huge thank you to all of our friends in the UK. These communities have 15 seconds or less, almost no time at all to get to a shelter, so it's extremely important. The aid that you provided right next to where the school buses and vans unload and pick up the children every day. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of our friends in the UK. God bless you. <laughs> to donate this room full of computers. We have many people, dignitaries and leaders of the Jewish community standing with me here today. And they've just been saying how important it is. This school did not have a computer room and how important it is to, to uh, teach about technology and to educate the youth. And so we're very excited to make a contribution to the school here and to the girls. We um, know that the children and the youth are the future of this country and we're excited to support them and to support this community and I wanted you, all of you our friends in England, to see all of these wonderful people here 
And you didn't get to hear all the speeches in Hebrew, but I'm telling you, they're sending you a very large thank you. And so God bless you, and thank you so much for your donation, which is going to help with the education of the young people here in the world. So pray for those who see the logo of the Christian Embassy and recognize that there are Christian friends around the world who love them and support them, that this will be an encouragement and a blessing to them. And thank you so very much for your prayers. God bless you from Israel. So I um, hope you can uh, maybe feel that you can contribute uh, towards the ministry and uh, for this sort of provision. As I mentioned, the UK has funded so far two bomb shelters, one for the Bedouin community. We felt we wanted to show as well that uh, sometimes people say, oh, you're only interested in Jews. No, that's, that's our calling, that's our ministry to Israel. But God loves all people. And, you know, there's enough hatred in this world, isn't there? So um, we've helped the Bedouin community um, uh, near to the Lebanese border. And Lebanon, again, as many of you know, is significantly supported by Iran. It has many thousands of rockets ready um, as a threat to Israel. ICJ is aiming to put many more bomb shelters in the north of Israel. That's a big goal. You saw those small ones and how short a time. And of course, these bombs, these rockets, you know, I mean, people in the West, they have an impression they're just sort of a bit bigger than fireworks. But, you know, they're missiles, flaming missiles. So the two bomb shelters cost £32,300. And the UK have bought them, provided for them. So thanks to you people here for your great provision. Amazing uh, for your support. And as I said, Israel is a multicultural society. Uh, one of uh, the members of that society are the Druze community. The Druze are a very poor but loyal minority in Israel. And we are able to help with the provision of the laptops and the computer equipment which you saw then in that school, uh, which was based, by the way, on uh, one of them was based on Mount Carmel. And again, that cost was £11,000. Thank you. That was all raised in 2021. And remember, this is all when the lockdown is on. Uh, we were able to uh, provide £5,000 for uh, women in crisis in Israel. And £30,000 went to the Holocaust Survivors Home. And more about that in a moment. And also, £62,000 were raised from the UK for Alia to bring the Jews home to Israel. And that is ongoing game, which I'll mention, because of uh, the Ukraine. So these are amazing amounts of money, you know, which have just been raised and... Uh, you know, we're just so grateful to God for this miraculous provision and for the generosity of his people that have made this uh, possible. <laughs> and uh, bringing it right up to date, I'm pleased to inform you that the UK branch, uh, so far in the Ukraine crisis, we have sent over £54,500 towards the Ukrainian Alia uh, war effort, which is bringing... Uh, Jews back to Israel and some of those people and you might well have seen that in our uh, correspondence and media outlets men some of them are Holocaust survivors it's unbelievable isn't it that they've been through the Holocaust and now they're going through this again so that's why I, I say to you you know that this is what you're giving uh, is going towards um, and in fact that last uh, amount of the 54,000 there were several thousand pounds of that money which was raised because of our new charitable status. So again, uh, we, we bless God 
We bless God for the way that he has put on people's hearts and given us gifted people who have been enabled us to have uh, this great facility made available. Now, linking uh, in with our support for ICEJ aid are our tours to Israel. We've always uh, had tours, and again, uh, Michael can t tell you about his in the past, but in this present day, uh, Mike and Marion Kerry <coughs> have just come back just a couple of days ago from Israel, and they led another fabulous biblical tour around the land. <coughs> in addition to visiting a host of biblical sites, they also visited a couple of the ICJ projects that have been sponsored, which I've mentioned about, uh, including the uh, Haifa home, uh, the Bedouin community uh, to the east of Haifa. And um, we want to just say again how we want to just help all the people who live in the land. Ah, and here are some of the photographs of, of the group who um, were there. I think that's the, is that the computer center, Marta? I, I can't see the writing from here. That's the Haifa home. That's the Holocaust survivor's home, which again I want to come back to from an, another angle a bit later. Okay, can we see the next one? Their Operation Life Shield, um, with the inscription for us, that's uh, in recognition that the UK have provided the money for that particular bomb shelter. There's many bomb shelters, of course, which ICJ have put round and where is this one of, Marta? That's outside. That's outside. So that's, qu that's quite a big bomb shelter. The one on Nicole's picture, that was the smallest one, wasn't it? Okay, and then just a couple more. That's inside the bomb shelter. So obviously uh, the other one was for the children. This is bigger for others. I, I was at one of the borders j just a couple of years ago. And we joined in with the Jewish community for a, a lunch together. And um, there were some elderly uh, people there. And I was talking to them and saying, when you hear the alarm going off, you know, does it, does it terrify you? And they said, well, no, actually, we've just got used to it as, as a way of life. But we know we've got to get out very quickly. And it is amazing that no one has been injured. And we're not talking about 10 or 20 rockets. You know, we're talking about thousands now that have been launched. So that's inside a bomb shelter, and I think there's one more, is there? Oh, uh, uh, yes, and this is a, a, a presentation uh, and uh, thanksgiving uh, for what you've done. That's, that's Mike on the left, on my left, for those who don't know, and Shmuel is it, uh, um, in the middle. Is that the last one? Oh, this is small, isn't it? He's in charge of the um, Holocaust survivors' home from the Jewish side. We work in cooperation. You know, we're not, where possible, of course, we want to live at peace with all men. And we try and show to the Jewish community that we're friends. We're not bitter enemies and that we're not just out, you know, to, for our own ends in it. Because, of course, their Messiah is our Messiah. And their God is our God. And uh, so our reputation is really growing in this way. <clears throat> now, if you've never been to Israel, I do guarantee that going on one of our biblical tours will give you a wonderful insight into an understanding of the Bible. It will greatly, greatly uh, just increase your personal devotion to the Lord. We've never found anyone who's gone to Israel and come back not a changed person. It's not like just going to Mallorca for a holiday and get a bit of sun or something. It's life-changing. <clears throat> and the Feast of Tabernacles this year, which is going ahead, is called, the title of it is The Land of Promise. The Land of Promise. And it is a land of promise. It's the only place in the world where the desert is not increasing. All the major deserts are expanding. In Israel, it's decreasing. Why? Because the desert is blossoming as a rose. And for those who've been in Israel, you know, it's just phenomenal, isn't it, to see how fertile it is. For our Feast of Tabernacles, our administrator, Joanne, and her husband, Tannel, uh, they'll be leading this tour. 
and they do a wonderful job. I've done it for many years now. And the big difference this time for the feast, it's not going to be just based in Jerusalem. It's going to go into Jerusalem, but it's going to be a tour throughout the land. So it's more a group activity with many, many nations involved. So if you are able and you'd like to go along to the Feast of Tabernacles, again, I think there's some literature, uh, you can contact our office and we'll, we'll fill you in. And the final tour that we have planned so far for this year is to take a group to Krakow and Auschwitz in October. Uh, uh, Mike Carey will be leading this, but obviously there is the unfolding tragedy in Ukraine that could affect the viability of that trip. Um, but however, if you're interested, and personally I think that everyone should try to visit Auschwitz as well once in their lifetime and to remember. You know, it doesn't matter what society you live in, so-called advanced Western society or so-called primitive society, the human heart is sick and desperately wicked. And it would remind us to remind others. <clears throat> right, well, I hope you're all uh, nice and refreshed and ready for our first teaching session. Now, I didn't uh, mention at the, at the start of the meeting, we have uh, uh, Paul and Nola or Higgins with us, and our relationship and friendship goes back over 40 years. <clears throat> and um, they've also been great friends and ministers to ICJ, regular uh, feast speakers in the past, and also they've taken many tours to Israel, uh, particularly from uh, the time when they were living in America, but they're still half in America. <laughs> Fun, you still are, <laughs> but they're m more back home in Ireland, in, in Southern Ireland. And it's not very often that you will have um, a priest come and speak to you, <laughs> but he's a royal priest now, he's no longer <laughs> the Catholic priest, but a great friend, we're going to have wonderful teaching. Please welcome Paul O'Higgins. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you, David, for having us. Thank you, ICEJ team. You're absolutely brilliant. I believe we're all at the stage where we're giving the Lord our five loaves and two fish, and he's just multiplying it to feed the nations. It's a tremendous time. Scripture says that foreigners will rebuild you. Their kings will be your uh, foster fathers, and their queens, your nursing mothers. So we have... Um, not just one queen in England, but we have many, many in the United Kingdom. We've got many, many queens and kings, priests, prophets, and kings. Yes, I, David mentioned I was a Catholic priest at one point, but I really got my mind blown away by the Word of God. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I've definitely been tampered with. The Word of God is absolutely renewing and changing our thinking, and once our thinking is changed, our behavior changes and our actions. Oh, Father God, we just thank you for your glorious, beautiful presence here and that we are welcome in your presence through the blood of Jesus, through the new and the living way, and that we, are bold, that we have bold access to your presence. And Father, we're just swimming in your goodness, enjoying your glory. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to impart revelation, vision, and the life and the nature of Jesus into us more and more until his works, his nature, his love, his words, and his ways come streaming into us and out of us as we're abiding in the vine. Holy Spirit, visit every single one of us this afternoon and do a work in our lives so that it'll be not just a communication of information, but the impartation of your own heart, of your burden, of your vision for the world and world redemption. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the world. Thank you for your faithfulness to Israel. Thank you for your faithfulness to the nations and that the good works and the good word and the good plan that you have will be established. We'll give you no rest, Lord, until we see Jerusalem appraised upon the earth. And we ask you, Lord, for the intercessors, priestly anointing to be upon every single one of us. We ask for the kingly anointing, there will be people able to do things. And we ask for the prophetic anointing that we may 
have a revelation into the word of God and speak it boldly without fear and without compromise in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks again for the welcome. And it was wonderful here to meet uh, some longtime friends. I never say old friends, longtime friends. Michael Young here who did so much to pioneer the work of the Christian Embassy in UK. And also Cyril and Gabrielle Thomas, whom we know from Ireland, who served the Lord so wonderfully in China for so many years. And now we're on the missions in Ireland. And, um, you know, places with long traditions of the gospel also need tremendous renewal. Because Jesus said, gave the warning, you make void the word of God by your tradition. And it's tremendous the weight of tradition and its power to control our thinking. And it's only the Holy Spirit can lock us loose of tradition. The Spirit reforms, renews our mind. And there's a mindset, a fixed mindset, especially in Western Christianity. We think we know it with such a long historical tradition. You know, in many, many Bible colleges in America, where we've lived really the last 40-something years, and uh, you'll be fired from your position as a Bible teacher if you think, if you teach certain things about the end times, if you don't think the standard line of the Left Behind series, <laughs> and, uh, if, and the, uh, many pastors fear to raise the subject of Israel because you might lose 10%, 20% of your congregation. This kind of thinking has to go, right? There's a cost to serving the Lord. There's a cost to the truth. The proverb says, buy the truth and sell it not, right? <laughs> And uh, it is a cause for following the Lord, but the reward is so wonderful because he opens up vistas, and Jesus asks us to follow him. Now, this, this um, morning, this afternoon, uh, first session, we want to share about uh, the God's covenant promises with Abram, and the, the title that was given to us was The Clock I is Ticking, Israel, The Clock is is ticking, the time clock is ticking. So we want to look at some of the time clocks controlling Israel, and God governs history by his word. We know that. By faith, we know that the word was framed by the word of God, so that what was seen came out of what was unseen. The world, the whole world, stars, moons, uh, the sky, the creatures, the creation, you and me, we came out of the word of God. We were formed not just by the mind and thought of God, but by the spoken word of God. We are proof of the existence of God's word. Everything comes into existence by God's word. He, has, he conceives it in his heart and in his mind, and he speaks it forth, and it happens. The word that goes forth from God's mouth is unstoppable. It cannot be stopped. It's sovereign. And uh, God has spoken his word, and he's got... Um, I read the other day... some. Uh, some quotation from Nietzsche, uh, that the, there is no such thing as truth. And he wished there was truth. Uh, and today you have in the, in the secular world, you follow your truth, I'll follow my truth. It's like in the days of judges. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. But Jesus came into the world to bear witness to the truth. There is such thing as truth. His word is true. And he said that we were to be sanctified, John 17, 17, by the truth. And the truth is his word. And probably some old ways of being sanctified when I went to serve the Lord first, responding to a call of God. I went a religious route in, at first until I found, until I met him, in, through, in, encountered him in the baptism in the spirit and in true salvation. And since then, the Holy Spirit has been leading me as he has you, leading us into further truth. And the truth is in his word. So it's all in one packet. Sanctify them by the truth. To sanctify is to set apart. To sanctify makes you different. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word is changing our thinking. It makes us different than the world around us. David spoke uh, earlier on about some new vocabulary we've been learning over the last few years, words. Uh, like tsunami, words like Zoom. How about words like fake news, right? <laughs> There's always been fake news. And uh, 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 the psalm speaks about Psalm 2. <clears throat> the nations rage against the Lord and against his anointed. The nations, that's the secular world out there, is not that uh, in favor of God's word 
and God's promises and Israel. The secular world is incensed against the Lord and against his Messiah, his anointed one. It's also the secular world is against his anointed people. Have you noticed? Have you read the report from Amnesty International? Have, have you followed what they say about Israel? Do they think the people who make these reports, that they see the report that we receive from Israel, from ICEJ, the truth of the way Arabs are treated in the land? Do they, but they follow our report of the father of lies. So we know that in the world, as well as the spirit of truth, there is the father of lies. And we're told in Psalm 1, where Psalm 2 speaks about the nations being incensed against the Lord and his anointed. <laughs> we're told that happy is the person who follows the counsel of the, war, of the Lord and doesn't watch, walk in the counsel of the ungodly. To walk in the counsel of the, of the Lord is to walk in the counsel of his word and to walk in his ways. And we have chosen his ways. Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. And when Jesus called disciples, and that's what you are in this room, your disciples, and he's saying, follow me. Don't follow the counsel of the nations. Follow the counsel of my word. My ways are altogether beautiful, and you will know the truth, and the truth will liberate you. It'll make you free, It'll, but it will change you. It'll make a difference between you and your thinking and the thinking of the world around you. Now, we're not in a posture of condemnation, or scolding to the world around us. But we're so grateful for the Lord for showing us and liberating us by his truth. And so as we're around the word of God this afternoon, he himself is sanctifying us just by seeing here. He's changing our thinking and he's changing us from glory to glory. Don't be afraid to be different. Don't be upset when the word of God, as it has come into your consciousness, by the revelation and by your study and by your meditation, has made you different and have you a different, ha make you have a different attitude towards Israel, towards life, towards truth, towards values. The Word of God contains prophecy, precepts, and promises. There are three elements of the Word of God. Promises, precepts, prophecies. The word of God, they, now the counsel of the ungodly doesn't understand the promises of God, doesn't understand the precepts of God. So we're living in a society that doesn't understand God's precepts, God, the moral values of the Lord, the teachings of the Lord. But we have chosen them. We understand what's ethical, what's moral, what's immoral. We understand the Ten Commandments. We understand we're... we're, we're uh, that the life of Jesus in us produces the fruit of the Spirit and changes us from the works of the flesh. We understand his precepts. But the Word of God isn't just precepts. It's also absolutely hinged around his promises and prophecies. And that's why the covenants that God made with Israel stand today. God has revealed a plan. Paul speaks in Ephesians that God has a plan for the fullness of the times, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Because we have the window of the word of God as a lamp to our pie, a path and a light to our feet, we understand that our lives is not, are not without meaning. We're not like the nihilists who say life has no meaning, you've just got to make it up. That's the prevailing understanding of today's world. Life is without meaning, you make it up. Try whatever works for you. But we know that our life has meaning. He's the truth. Means it's, he's the meaning. Life has meaning because of him. He destined us before the foundation of the world, before he even spoke the word concerning the creation of sun, moon, and stars, planets. He had you in mind, and he destined you and me to be his sons and daughters. And he also saw before the foundation of the world that we human beings would go our own way, but he also saw that he had a plan to bring us back to his way. The lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. In the light of the word of God, we have a vision, an insight, a window into God's plans, purposes, and meaning for our lives. That's why it's so important. 
That's why our lives are built upon a rock. He is the wise man who hears the words of mine and does them. Is the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. We're building our lives on, the prom on his work and promises. All to say this, that a disciple is, will be different. Don't be surprised if you're not able to persuade the world around you to your point of view. But you yourself give yourself to the calling of God. Now, God rev began to reveal his plan for world redemption in the, in the covenants he made with Israel. And we're familiar with the covenant he made with Abram. In Genesis chapter 12, he made this covenant with Abram. I will bless you and make you a blessing. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Remember, always remember, that in the covenant that God made with Abram, and it was reiterated to Isaac and repeated again to Jacob, so it's covenant with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, that in this covenant, there is absolutely nothing racist in it because it's the covenant to bless all the peoples of the world, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So if you want to see all the families of the earth to be blessed, all the tribes and tongues and people of the earth to be blessed, God has a strategy and God has a plan, and it's locked up with the calling of a certain individual and his family and his descendants to be blessed, to inhabit a certain section of the world that he gave to them. It's the land of promise. He promised them to these people. And in Genesis 17, verse 7, it says that this is a never lasting covenant. That this covenant promised to give them the land, to call them to be a blessing. This covenant with them can never be removed. And that means it's an operation on the earth today. God is engineering his plan for world redemption through remembrance of his covenant. Now, Abram was told that his family would be strangers and sojourners in the land for 400 years. That's 400 years, except Abram was 75 years when he came into the land. And when Isaac was five years old, that was 30 years later, he, uh, that's when he had descendants, a descendant, uh, a promised descendant, Isaac. He entered when, at the weaning of Isaac when he was five years old. Uh, he, he was told this your family would be strangers for 400 years. And then in, Eze in uh, Exodus chapter 12, the, uh, the Passover story, at the end of 430 years, at that precise time, God released the children of Israel from their bondage to slavery in Israel. In, not only does God make promises and prophecies and covenants, but he makes certain types of promises which are time-related prophecies, and I call them time-release locks. Abram was told that his family would be 400 years in slavery and bondage to in, in uh, strangers and sojourners from the land of promise. Then when that 400 years was up, 430 years after the Abrahamic covenant was first given, at that moment, God released them in Exodus chapter 12. So just let, look at a few of those scriptures in, in, in Exodus chapter 12, verse uh, 40. The time of the <coughs> that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. See, this was a release of a timing that was foretold to Abraham. Had they, had they been released from Egypt one year later, then Abraham would have been a false prophet because he was told the sojourn would be 400 years, 430 years from when he received the, the covenant promise. And that precise year, had they came out one year early, it would be 429 years. But the time lock of God, our times are caught up in a time cycle, known only to God fully, but revealed partially to us through the scriptures, that we, our life is in a time plan of God, a time for the fullness of times to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. History has a meaning. 
The philosophers of history, there is a, a branch of philosophy called the philosophy of history. Does history have a meaning? Is it just random? Is it just the conflict between classes and uh, the oppressed and the, and the oppressors? Is it an endless cycle of conflict? That's what most historians believe, by the way. But we know that history has a meaning. Uh, when he's in, uh, I think it was 1942, when Winston Churchill addressed the Houses of Congress in America, and uh, he was half American, <laughs> Winston Churchill, uh, he said that you'd have to be blind indeed in your soul if you didn't recognize that there's a hidden hand guiding th the plan of history to its conclusion. We know there's a hidden plan, but it is being partly revealed. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, that Deuteronomy 29, 29, but the things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So we, know, we don't know everything, but we do know some things, and we're peering into these things. Now, the plan of God is revealed through his promises and prophecies. Every word spoken by God will be fulfilled. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. It was Balaam that spoke that one. These words of those whose eyes are opened. <laughs> Our eyes have been opened into the plan and the purpose of God. It's a privilege to see what you see. It's a privilege to see what we see. Most people in the United Kingdom or Ireland, or the United States where we live, don't see these things. But we see these things because we have found the Messiah, and he's opened our eyes, and he's given us a spirit of revelation. Do you remember the disciples on the way to Emmaus? Jesus opened their eyes to understand the scriptures, and your eyes and my eyes have been opened. Do you know that in most seminaries in the United Kingdom, do not speak on the subject of Israel? They don't speak much about miracles either or the supernatural. But this is a subject they don't want to enter into. Now, the whole of the plan of God hinges from the covenant of Ab Abram. Paul writes in Galatians, the gospel was first preached to Abram when he said, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Galatians chapter 3. The gospel was first preached to Abram. So if we are evangelicals, gospel people... <laughs> We should understand that the gospel was first preached to Abram. In other words, God revealed a plan that he desires all nations to be restored under the canopy of his blessing. The mechanism how this is, is to be fulfilled is through the atonement he provided on the cross and that this gospel of reconciliation to go to the ends of the earth, that Christ, God was in the Messiah reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but he made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, we're ambassadors for the Messiah. We're ambassadors for the Messiah, for the work of the atonement, and for the covenant spoken to Abram that was fulfilled when Yeshua died on the cross. And this promise is fulfilled because the curse that fell upon the whole humanity from Adam on, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law of Galatians 3.13, having become a curse for us, that the blessings of Abram might come upon Gentiles through faith. Isn't that the same as Exodus, uh, Genesis 12? Of course it is. Now, if the covenant, the only covenant that God is operating in is the new covenant, then the writers of the new covenant themselves are false preachers. Because in Romans 15.8, it says that Jesus came to confirm the words spoken to the prophets. He didn't come to abolish them. He came to confirm the words. Now, much of our Christian tradition in Europe has taught us that Jesus came to replace the words spoken to the prophets. Also, we read when Mary, the wonderful mother of Jesus, when she received this message that she was to be the mother of the Messiah, she began to break out in a glory spell when she visited her cousin Elizabeth down in Ein Karem. And she said, 
My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He who is mighty has done good things to me. And he goes on to say, she goes on to say, he's remembered the covenant spoken to our fathers, to Abram and his children forever. She saw the coming of the Messiah as the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. So should we. Wouldn't it be wonderful all those uh, people in my country of Ireland that love Mary so much if they all became champions <laughs> for the message that Mary brought? That her son is fulfilling the covenant promises for Abram to extend the blessings of Abram to all nations and to break the curse that's over the whole world. Today we see a world that's convulsed with trouble and pain and sorrow and suffering. And we know that's all part of the oppression that came into the world through sin and is amplified by our sin and the sin of further generations. So much suffering in the world. But he came to lift us out of that horrible pit of suffering through his atoning sacrifice and lift us into the dimension of his kingdom to convey us from the kingdom of darkness and oppression and suffering to restore us into the realm of his blessing. And even we, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, we're living in an oppressed world, so it affects us to some extent also until he comes. That first time release lock, 430 years of sojourn of the children of Israel, and always remember that you as disciples of the Lord, you've been called out of the world's thinking uh, you're British, but you're not typically British. <laughs> I'm Irish, but I'm not typically Irish. I've been tampered with by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Indeed, Yeshua himself was Jewish, but he wasn't typical Jewish because the Lord brought him into the, he came into the pure light, was in the pure light, was the pure light, and didn't participate in some of the religious accoutrements that had come ac across, come around his own tradition. Today, the Lord is calling out disciples to himself. If we continue in his word, then we're truly his disciples, and we allow that word to shape our thinking and our actions. It was so beautiful to see that presentation that David made of how the, the revelation of the place of Israel in the hearts and in the, in the plan of God has influenced the hearts of those who've embraced it here in the UK and how it has resulted in so many beautiful acts of love towards Israel that has a, having a profound impact on the Jewish people. They, they like to keep, oh well, this is just our little worship for ourselves, but the Jewish people can't keep it themselves because it's not just a plan to bless them, but for all nations. In fact, some of the rabbis got quite upset and said, We're, you're stealing our feasts. <laughs> no, we said, they're not your feasts, they're the feasts of the Lord. <laughs> They're not the feast of Israel, they're the feast of the Lord and his people. Now the fulfillment is in the Messiah. We all, it's wonderful to study how the Messiah fulfills these feasts. But that's another subject. So uh, the scriptures also did speak to the Jewish people by way of warning, to the Israeli people by way of warning, that if you don't obey my ways and walk in these ways, you'll be dislodged from your land. And in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse uh, 7, I believe it is, Je in Jeremiah chapter 29, God spoke to Jeremiah and to many of the prophets that they were, going, they were going to fail to prevail before Babylon. The Babylonian Empire was growling around Israel. And uh, first the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, they were threatening Israel. Israel was becoming weaker. They were growling towards Israel like Putin towards Ukraine. It's a horrible thing. We need to pray about that. But they were beginning to reach towards Israel. And the is the many of the prophets in Israel were saying, look, God is with us. God has spoken his word. We will prevail. They will not succeed. And they began to prophesy that they would not go into exile. But Jeremiah was quoting... Deuteronomy, which said, if you don't obey my teachings, you'll be thrown out of the land. And Jeremiah said, I hate to say, say this to you, but we're going to lose the land on a temporary basis. And he said, in Jeremiah 29, he said, for 70 years, we will be sent into exile. 
And that's exactly what happened. The Babylonians came in and they, they destroyed the temple. They destroyed the city. This brought the Jewish people into Babylon. But also the prophecy of Jeremiah, there were four prophecies he made. The temple would be destroyed. The city be taken. The people would go into exile. And number four, they'd come back. And he said that after 70 years, you'll come back. And uh, then in, in um, Daniel, we see that Daniel was there in the exile. And he began to read the prophecies of Jeremiah. And he said, oh, we're only supposed to be here for 70 years. The 70 years is nearly over. Let's get moving towards Jerusalem. And he began to pray. It didn't happen automatically. Nothing happens until someone gets a vision of God's purposes. In other words, God doesn't just sovereignly move. He does sovereignly move, but part of the way he sovereignly moves, he, tur he stirs up prayer on earth towards him to fulfill his pur purposes. Because God doesn't operate without agreement on this side. So he looks for those who will stand in agreement with him. They're the true intercessors who watch over God as he watches over his word to perform it. So Daniel gave himself to prayer. He didn't say, oh, I read in the scripture, we're going to come back in 70 years. Let's see how it happens. He gave himself to prayer. And then we read at the end of Second Chronicles. Now in the first year of just the last few verses of the book of Chronicles. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. For when God has spoken a word, and it's truly his word, it will be established and nothing can stop it. So that this word might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation to this secular leader, God moved whatever it took. God moved on Cyrus to bring the, the uh, Jewish people back to the land. So, so that the, he, he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom. He also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah, Whoever is among you of all the people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. So he released the Jewish people to go back up to Jerusalem. And the end of that 70-year time lock was up. Had God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus one year earlier, Jeremiah would have been a false prophet. Had he stirred it up one year later, Jeremiah had been a false prophet. But you see, the times of Israel not only are foretold of old, but that actual time dating is, is, is foretold from of old. That we may know that it is truly God fulfilling his plan. After 430 years in Egypt, of the, which ended with their time in Egypt, no power, no great world power could stop. No Pharaoh, the greatest power of the time, could keep them back from their destiny. There is no power on heaven and earth than he, that can keep Israel back from its destiny. But there are many powers that can oppose its destiny. Now, we stand with God's plan and purpose. And it's been a privilege for us to be grafted in to God's plan and purpose. To be taken out of the plans and the purposes and the fallen theologies, even of Christian tradition, and to be grafted into God's truth. We know the truth, and the truth has made us free from a lot. And as we know more truth, it'll make us free from more. The truth has set us free from anti-Semitism for starters, hasn't it? And made us see this is the plan and the purpose of God. It's not just, oh, you're a Christian Zionist. That's a political and some sort of a Jewish hyper-nationalist, like the zealots. Well, we are Christian Zionists. We support the establishment of Zion. When God builds up Zion, when the Lord builds up Zion, he shall appear in glory. But we're not just political activists. We're people who understand the plan and the purpose of God and long for him to fulfill his word. We say to him, be it done, Lord, according to your word. Let your plan for us as individuals be fulfilled. Let your plan for the body of Christ be fulfilled. Let your plan for Israel be fulfilled. And let your plan for world redemption be fulfilled. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So we're people who get our mind set our vision of reality, our vision of who we are from the Word of God, from Yeshua and from the Word of God. 
who G Yeshua is one with his word, we get our vision of, we understand who we are from the word of God. We understand what history is from his word. Now, if you go to university and try to analyze what it is to be a human being, what history, what is the meaning of history, without any reference to the word of God and the scriptures, you will be unable to come up with an answer because God has revealed these things to the prophets. He's revealed them to us. He's revealed them to his word. So that's why a nation which doesn't walk in the light of the word of God is given over to ignorance. So there's a tremendous need in Europe and in Britain, because we won't lump Britain in with Europe anymore. There's a tremendous need for biblical Ill illiteracy to be done away with. For a knowledge of the word of God is really the hope. From there we understand who we are. Now, the third great time release lock that I want to speak about is that when Jesus was on, on the Mount of Olives, how many have been in the, on the Mount of Olives? Fantastic, more than half of you. When you go on the Mount of Olives, you know the Mount of Olives looks down over the Temple Mount area, which is very interesting, which is actually just a small aside. When Jesus was on the cross, we believe it was on the Mount of Olives because the uh, centurion was able to look down into the temple area and watch the veil of the temple being rent in two, been torn in two. That's the only place where you could look down over the temple because the Mount of Olives looks down over the temple. Every other part of Jerusalem is lower than it. But anyway, they, when Jesus was on the Mount of Olives with his disciples, <laughs> they had just been admiring the buildings of the temple. And the, uh, Jesus said, you know, they were, this temple, of course, he knew who the last builder of the temple or the great rebuilder of the temple, King Herod. And uh, Jesus was not a big fan of King Herod. And uh, he had tried to kill him when he was a little baby. So, see these stones, Jesus said, not one stone will be left standing on another. And he gave four prophecies concerning Jerusalem and the Jewish people. He said, and that's why they said Jesus was like Jeremiah, because he prophesied that once again the temple would be destroyed, once again the people would be scattered, once again the people would go into exile. But the fourth prophecy, the best part of it, once again the people would return. Amen. As they look over the temple, Matthew 24, as you know, Jesus is teaching about the end of end times. You'll find them in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. They're the three, three sections of Jesus, where Jesus spoke about these things. And when you put them all together, they said to him, them, when will these things be? We have a right to ask the Lord, when? <laughs> How long, O oh Lord? When? We want to know when we are in world history. When are we? Where are we? We're in the plan of God. We're destined in love to be his sons. It's, it was an election by God for over us and for Israel. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That was the question. What would be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And when will these things be? When, the, when will the destruction of Jerusalem take place? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And he gives these four prophecies. And then in Luke 21, 24, there's this favorite part of that a section of Jesus is teaching. And Jerusalem will be trampled down underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. The word until means not forever. <laughs> not forever. So Jerusalem, Jesus said, will be under Gentile domination. Times of the Gentiles mean Gentile domination. In this case, Gentile domination over Jerusalem. The time of Gentile domination lasted a long time. We know that after the Romans came in, the Roman Empire developed and morphed into the Byzantine Empire. Byzantine semi-Christian empire, semi-Christian, semi-pagan, I would say. And then after the Byzantines came the Muslims in the seventh century, the 600s. The Muslims conquered Jerusalem and that part of the Middle East. And then they remained they 
maintained control over Jerusalem until 1917, except for 100 year period where the Crusaders had control over Jerusalem. And then in 1917, the British received control on, under General Allenby. What a wonderful moment that was when General Allenby stepped off his white horse and walked reverently through the Jaffa Gate into Jerusalem. What a super heritage that is. And um, we know that Oswald Chambers, how many read Oswald Chambers? <laughs> I love Oswald Chambers. And he was a chaplain in the, uh, one of Allenby's divisions in Egypt. So um, uh, in 1917, the end of Muslim domination came to an end, but not the end of Gentile domination. And uh, we know that it remained under British mandate until 1947, which wasn't perfectly handled, as you know. But then in 1947, uh, when the State of Israel was created, or was permission for it to be created was cre by the United Nations in November 1947, uh, then Jerusalem came under Jordanian control. They grabbed it and held it until 1967 uh, when these nations came against to Israel, Egypt and Jordan and others, and they thought they would destroy it, but they didn't. And Israel was able to get control of the city of Jerusalem and of the West Bank, but that was never legalized yet. It's still up for debate, isn't it? So Jerusalem came back under Jewish control in 1967. That was the end of a time release lock. Remember Jesus' words again. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? We've always wanted to know that in Christianity. When, when are you coming? Now, in timing, in God's timing, we can say we're living in the last days since the ascension of Jesus. Because Peter said on the day of Pentecost, on the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he, he said what's going on now is the last days events. So we're in the last days. Well, that's kind of a long period, isn't it? It's, it's 2,000 years ago now. The last days <coughs> is that section of history between the ascension of Jesus and his return. But the end of the age is the last section <laughs> of the last days. Now we're in the last section of the last days, the end of this particular age, which you could call it the church age. We're the end of this particular age, and we're coming into the kingdom age. We're on a threshold. We're in a time of great groaning and travail. We're also a time when there's great anger from the devil because his hour is short. So it's, a very, it's quite a difficult time to live. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Difficult times but it's preparing for the greatest times of all. Never interpret end time prophetic teaching as a negative or a down downer. Remember, it's the blessed hope. It's the whole hope of the world. The earth will be turned into a paradise under the rule of the Messiah. More of that in the next session. But look up. When you see these things take place, don't get into depression. Go, don't get into despair. Don't get into discouragement. Look up. Your redemption is drawing nigh. And we're alive at a very wonderful time in world history. But we need to be awake like the wise virgins, you know. See, these things are to, to, spoken to us to awaken us. A lot of the church is asleep. Where the church is not awakened to Israel, it's asleep. I'm not saying they're not Christians, but they're Christians who are asleep. They're in the sin bin or someplace, you know. They're not in the ball game. They're not in the, in the game. They're not being fruitful. And we're being filled with oil and wine and truth to be alerted. The trumpet is blowing. The word of God blowing the trumpet. God is remembering his promises. In Exodus, it actually begins that God remembered the word that he watched the travail of, his, of the children of Israel in Egypt. And God remembered his covenant with Abram. God remembered the covenant. God remembered the covenant when he brought them back out of Babylon again. And God remembered the covenant when he brought them back from the, all the nations in which they were scattered. Jeremiah 31 writes, He who scatters Israel will gather them and shepherd them as a shepherd does his flock. Most replacement theologians would agree if you ask them, how many believe that God scattered Israel because of their disobedience or a fail failure to recognize their hour of visitation? They'd all say, yes, 
Well, do you, do you accept the second part of that statement? He who scattered Israel will gather them and shepherd them as a shepherd does his flock. So many scriptures from Isaiah, from Jeremiah, from Ezekiel, from Zechariah about the regathering of Israel, not from one nation, but from every nation under heaven. And this is the time in which we're living right now, the final regathering of Israel. And specifically, the bringing of Jerusalem back under Jewish control. Yeah. Now, I mentioned that about time release locks, that Abram was given a 430 year time release lock. Paul refers to that in Galatians. The law, which came 430 years later, didn't annul the other covenant. That's a very important principle, not only the time lock, but that the Sinai law did not annul the Abrahamic law. One covenant, God makes these covenants, layers them, the Abrahamic covenant, the Sinai covenant, the new covenant, and the Davidic covenant. God layers these covenants one upon the other. One covenant does not annul another. That's Paul's principle. So their failure under the Sinai covenant doesn't annul God's promise to them. And Paul says, this promise was given to them 430 years before the law ever came. And Abram was declared righteous 430 years before the law was ever given. So there must be a way of getting righteous before the law was ever given because this man was declared righteous by faith. It was God's election. Well, their disobedience has annulled God's covenant. How can it? Paul says a covenant cannot be annulled because God is not a liar. He came to confirm the promises given to the fathers. I mean, it's basic logic that a 10-year-old can understand, but the theologians in some of these colleges cannot understand it. Oh, they're great Bible scholars. Really? When they can't see the nose in their own face? Is that great Bible scholarship? It's clever scholarship, but it's not great Bible scholarship. I thank you, Father, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the learned, but you've revealed them to mere babes. You see, it's through the heart we understand the things of God. It's on our knees we learn the scriptures. The, the natural mind, the intellectual mind, Paul says, cannot receive the things of the Spirit. They're foolishness to him. But it's the Spirit reveals these things. So they come from our spirits into our minds and then out into our hands. Lord, teach me your ways. Don't be wise in your own opinions. Lean not to your own understanding. And see, these people who are such high IQs, I'm not saying these Bible scholars don't have high IQ. They do. But it's not an IQ thing. It's a revelation thing. Yeah. Oh, Lord, that you would reveal your word to us. These prophets, God revealed the word to them. And these words would be like fire. They would propel the way we live, like a fire in a steam engine. It would propel and drive us on. They were driven by the word of God. Back to this time lock. Abram was given a 430-year time lock. Daniel, um, Jeremiah, a 70-year time lock. But does, is there in the scripture any indication of the time period of Israel's exile to the nations? And I believe there is in Daniel chapter 8. And we'll just take a look at that for, for a moment too. And I believe that Jesus, being a greater prophet than Jeremiah and Abraham, obviously more than a prophet, but being a greater prophet than Jeremiah and, Ab and Abraham, was able to give a time period for the restoration of Jerusalem. And we see it here in Daniel chapter 8, where he gives this prophecy in Daniel 8. It looks a bit cryptic at first, but it's not that cryptic because Daniel himself interprets uh, the uh, prophecy. Daniel 8, verse 6. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with two horns, which had, had, I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram between the two horns, and the ram had no power to stand before him. And uh, then in verse 29, Daniel gets the interpretation of that vision. 
uh, verse tw uh, 28, as for the ram that you saw, the two horns, these are the kings of the Medes and the Persians. So thank God we don't have to guess what this prophecy means. Medes and the Persians are, are the uh, ram with the two horns, and the goat is the king of Greece. Very simple. So Daniel sees the king coming from Greece, coming and destroying the empire, the Medes and Persians. And we know that this happened in world history in 332 BC. Uh, the king of Greece, Alexander, conquered the Middle East, including the Medes and the Persians, and including Israel, came under his sovereignty. 332 BC, a great a year in European history. And then in the middle of this, Daniel sees two angels having a discussion. <laughs> Lord, give us, open our eyes, make us open the prophetic to us more. Uh, verse um, 13, then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, how, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the, uh, of, of the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. The sanctuary here is not the uh, temple, but it's Jerusalem. How long will it be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles? The exact phrase that Jesus used in Luke 21, 24, and Jerusalem will be trampled down underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And he knew back from Alexander, 2,300 years from, from Daniel's prophecy, uh, overheard by uh, Daniel as the two angels are talking to one another, that it will be 2,300 years from the time of Alexander the Great before Israel would be liberated to Jewish control again. Of course, he couldn't speak, a, talk about A.D., B.C., <laughs> but if you take 2,300 from when Alexander conquered the Middle East in 332 B.C., it'll bring you to 1967. Because 332 plus 2,300 will take you to 1968, but remember, there's no year zero. So you subtract a year, it brings you to 1967. Isn't that amazing? So this is not just an accident of history. Israel isn't just a colonial power that took over, came in there by some chance of history. It's the sovereign hand of God working. As Winston Churchill said, you have to be blind and completely blind in soul not to recognize there's a sovereign hand working, unseen hand working through history. Well, we just don't guess at that. We see it in the scriptures themselves. Not only in the prophetic scriptures, but in the time-specific prophetic scriptures that were an amazing thing. Now, we don't know all the times. I can't say that Jesus will come in another 15 years. I wish I could, but we don't know. It's not given us at this point to know certain things. We don't know whether it be another 10, 20, 30, 40 years before the Lord returns, but it can't be very far off. This is the time to look up and have a vision. What's the future of the planet? What direction is the planet going? We'll look at that in the next session. Lula, would you share a little bit here? I was just thinking here that Jesus, Jesus yeah, not. anyway, we're not, to, we're not to add or subtract from the word of God. And I think to add or subtract from the word that you just heard this morning would rob it away, so I dare not do it. <laughs> 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 I like when she says something, though, because <laughs> she's loaded. <laughs> so we just thank you, Lord. It's what a privilege to live at this time. God made a promise. He cannot revoke his promises. Mary says it. Paul says it. The time release locks. I bring them back from all the nations where they're scattered. Maybe in the next session, we'll read some of those scriptures just to begin. So... How many would say, Lord, I want to follow not the counsel of the ungodly? Remember, when we talk about the scripture says the counsel of the wicked, the psalm says wicked, but I prefer to ungodly. That is, who, those who don't factor God into their understanding of life. We're not saying they're bad people. We're not cursing them or judging them. But we're saying you can't trust their advice, especially when it comes to moral issues or from the, for the meaning of life. You won't get your meaning of life from Oxford University or from London University, or from Cambridge, you'll get it from the scriptures. How many want to be disciples of the Lord? 
Come in, Lord. Let's just stand formally before the Lord. And Lord, we present ourselves before you in this holy moment. Washed in your blood, Lord. Washed clean from the world in which we, you brought us to. Washed clean by your blood. You've given us a robe of righteousness. You've made us who were, once were no people. You've made us your people. You've cleansed us with your word. You've washed us with your blood. You've washed us with your word. You've made us kings and priests unto God. And you've given us your name. And you've given us your word. And you've sanctified us in the truth. Father, we know that you're sending us into a world that's quite hostile to your ways. But we're to bring your light into this world. And we ask you that we'll be steadfast, full of love, full of truth, bearing witness to your truth in a spirit of love wherever we go. Anoint us with a new fervency in our prayer to be priests. Anoint us with a mouth that none of our adversaries can withstand. Give every one of us in this room, especially those who are timid, tongue-tied, and have low self-esteem of themselves. We cancel that lie and ask you to give every one of us a word, a mouth for you, that no adversary can withstand. In a simple way, we communicate truth, that it be so sharp and strong. And then, Lord, give us a heart and a hand to serve you. Count us in as your disciples, whom you've called out of the fallen ways of the world around us, into your glorious plans and purposes. Spirit of the living God, seal us now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. So now the day is far spent. So I won't, I won't wear you out. I won't go for two hours. But... <laughs> But when the day was far spent, Nula's reminding me, that's when Jesus gave the best Bible study ever, right? The two guys on the way to Emmaus. I assume they were a couple. Uh, this, the uh, present scholarship on that is that they were a couple on the way to Emmaus. <laughs> so, um, and they got so much strength from it that they ran all the way home. That's pretty good, isn't it? Back to Jerusalem. They got a surge of strength. And the Word of God gives us strength. We live by Romans 8.11. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Do you ever feel so weak that you're almost dead? Yes. Well, at that point, you tap in to the resurrection life. There's a life beyond our own life, the resurrection life of Jesus. And that gives life not only to our spirit, where it comes up as a spring of living water, but it also gives life to every cell of our mortal bodies. And so when we're creaking and we're this way or the other way, we ask that, that life just comes into every, permeates every cell of our bodies, our spinal column, our brain cells, our ear cells, our cardiovascular system, and our lungs, all made alive, quickened, made alive and renewed by the resurrection life of Jesus. Oh, Lord, we just thank you that Mark is going to experience your resurrection life flowing yes, through his God. body, flowing through his eyes, his feet, and his whole system. And in Jesus' name, he's going to be a Lazarus man, a resurrection man, in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, release a word of refreshment, encouragement, and vision for every single one of us. And let there be an impartation, even as the word goes forth this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, without you, we're helpless and hopeless. It's hard to be a preacher, you know, because when you're, uh, David will tell you this, it's not as easy as it seems because when you're speaking the word of God, you're confronted, at least I am, with a tremendous sense of your own weakness. I believe it's part of God getting ready to speak. You say, well, I've got that, and here's the five points, and you just list it out. That's in the natural. But in the spiritual order, you can't quite speak like that, and you're confronted with a profound sense of your own inability. I was encouraged in that when one time when I heard, I read something, Smith Wigglesworth, a transcript of one of his messages, and Smith Wigglesworth said, weakness, I'm full of it. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, it's the Lord, we're also full of him, right? I'll boast of my weakness that the power of God may rest in me. Don't be surprised at the kind of people that the Lord will raise up to speak his word in these end days. Amazing. It'll be like David's army, the ragamuffin army. We're finding in America in, in the last few years, we're moving more among the ragamuffin army than ever before. It's amazing. And they're coming streaming to the Lord uh, in such a wonderful, wonderful way. 
Now, this, um, what's a, this afternoon, I want to talk about the, continue on the time clock of Israel. What's, a ne what's next? What's ahead for Israel? What's ahead for Israel? And we ended the last session by talking about the regathering of Israel. And I want to just read a few scriptures on that because I didn't read many scriptures or any scriptures on that, for that matter. So I'm just going to go to this, bo this book here and I'll just read some Israel and prophecy. I've wanted some of the scriptures here I want to read. And um, I've compiled some of them here. Uh, just the prophecy of gathering and regathering and the am this amazing event of God remembering the Abrahamic covenant and bringing people back from the four corners of the earth. A few of them here. Um, it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people that are left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, and Shinar, from Hamath, and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. That had not taken place in Yeshua's day. And they asked Jesus in Acts chapter 1-8 when he, when he was ascending, about to ascend into heaven, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? We're going to look into that this afternoon. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not given to you to know the times and seasons which are fixed. <laughs> the time release lock, <laughs> time release lock is fixed, it's set, but none of us knows. I can't read the date on the time release lock <laughs> or the hour, but we know it's not. But you shall receive power to be my witnesses to the end in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In the meantime, we're being anointed to bring the great invitation. I like to call the gospel the great invitation. It's an invitation to the least, to every, every tribe, every race, every people of any ethnicity, any culture, any religion. Come, come to the Lord. He's done enough. The blood of Jesus has paid for the sins of the world. Be reconciled to God. Wherever you're coming from, God has a welcome for you. So, but you, we've been anointed for that, but also our expectation is also for him to return, to restore the kingdom to Israel. And um, first, he's, Jesus knew that he could not establish the kingdom in the days of his first coming, because as yet, that scattering to all the nations hadn't taken place, and as yet, the regathering from all the nations hadn't taken place. So the scriptures, especially Ezekiel, makes it clear that the enthronement of Yeshua as the king of Israel will not take place until this last regathering from all the nations. Had Jesus set up the kingdom on what we call Palm Sunday, when he rode into Jerusalem and they were cheering him and hailing him as the Messiah, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save now, send prosperity now, but the next bit is bind the sacrifice to the altar, he knew that the sacrifice had first to be bound to the altar. And this great dispersion to the four corners of the earth and the destruction of the temple that he had for, and the scattering of the people that he saw, that that also had first to take place. So, but now this great regathering has taken place and we are the first generation in history ever <laughs> to, that can intelligently hope for the return of the Lord in our lifetime because he could not have come back until that regathering to Jerusalem had taken place. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. He could not have come in Paul's lifetime because that, that scattering hadn't taken place or, or, and, and the regathering from all the nations and also the gospel of the kingdom that go as a witness to every nation. So this is, I bring them from the four corners of the earth. Um, also, let's look at um, Isaiah uh, 43, 5 and 6. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather them from the west. I will say up to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And that's been one of the great missions of the, of the Christian embassy and others in these times. It's amazing. Uh, Ezekiel said, I will bring them uh, from, from the peoples and gather them from the countries. I will bring them to their own land. 
for I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries. Now, how is it that so many of the churches and Bible teachers cannot see these realities? A blindness is coming, but that blindness is coming down because you pray that it will come down, and it's coming down in Jesus' name. Today we're going to look at some scriptures about, uh, about Daniel's prophecies concerning Israel. We're going to have fun, relax. This is not the last word about Israel. It's not the perfect word about Israel. So if I'm wrong, feel free to disagree. So we can relax, right? <laughs> so uh, turn to the one beside them, pinch them, and say, relax. <laughs> 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 we're just we're going to have fun here. <laughs> Enter the rest. Okay. So uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, um, I just want to go to that one. That's where he's, Ezekiel has that vision of Jerusalem being gathered out of the grave. And uh, where will it all end? It ends in the enthronement of the Messiah. Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, verse um, 18. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, take a stick. Write, write on it uh, for Judah and for the people of Israel associated with them. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph and the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel and join them together. There's the joining of the Jew and the Gentile in these days. And uh, in the passage preceding this, I won't quote it, he t is the vision of the valley of dry bones. These people are very dead. And he sees, he, he prophesies to them and they come alive as a great army. And then he prophesies again. And he says, prophecy to the wind. Prophecy to the bones. And he speaks to the bones. Then he says, prophecy to the wind. Because though, there was, though they were alive as a great army, as a great uh, community of people, there was still something missing. There was no breath in them. They weren't regenerated. Because the essence of regeneration is that the Spirit of God comes into us. Some people like to use the phrase born again, but, uh, which is used by Jesus, used by Peter. But the most common phrase in the book of Acts is, have you received the Holy Spirit? <laughs> he breathed it on them, and they received, we, we received the Holy Spirit. One day Jesus breathed it into me, and I received the Holy Spirit. What a wonderful event that is, because the life of God comes rushing into us, and we become a new human being, new creation, a, cr a person fused and joined to the life of Jesus. And that's the amazing reality of new birth, of infilling of the Holy Spirit. And, but he sees these people as a, as a great throng of people gathered from all the nations, coming out of, this, uh, of, of the graves like bones, which is really a picture of the Holocaust almost. And uh, how literally that's almost that scripture is being fulfilled. But he, then he says prophecy to the breath. Now the prophecy to the bones is preaching. To prophecy to the breath Come Holy Spirit is prayer. And he calls on the wind to come and fill these people. And that's what we're doing. We see in Israel uh, them coming back from the nations, but we also see something missing. We long for them to look upon him whom they have pierced, to be filled with his spirit. And so uh, Ezekiel sees this gathered back, and he's, he's told the prophecy of the breath. And he says, um, in verse 22, and I will make them one nation on the land and on the mountains of Israel. Interesting, the mountains of Israel, because that's the area of Judea and Samaria. That's the area that the United Nations, Israelis call them United Nothing, <laughs> the is but the United Nations doesn't want Israel to settle on the mountains of Israel, where Jacob laid his pillow, where Jacob had these dream. Uh, but United Nations says one thing, but God says another. God says, man, man says. Man says, God says. You could write a book on that one. Man says, God says. <laughs> and uh, are we, we follow what God says, not what man says. Man's, today's m moral standard for man, that man says is, what is moral. What man said is moral, what God says is moral are two different things, aren't they? So what man says, what, it, what life means is one thing. What God says, what life means is another. We looked into that. And he says, they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols and their detestable things, but I will save them from all their backslidings in which they have sinned, and I will cleanse them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. 
God says, I will do this. God will unilaterally do this. Isn't that wonderful? That's the sovereign and spoken plan of God, that the regathering of Israel is not just that there'll be another Gentile nation, like David said, but there will not another normal nation. There could never be a Gentile nation, but that there will be a spirit-filled nation. And next step after that, and my servant David shall be king over them. And they shall, not, shall have, uh, all have one shepherd. They shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. That's wonderful. So the, the whole process of the regathering of Israel is moving towards the reestablishment of the Davidic covenant, the reestablishment of the throne of David. Remember the last question of the uh, disciples of Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? The last part of God's plan for Israel, this whole great movement, is going to result in a great unity between the real believers and the people of Israel and Christian embassy as this great part of, of this great reconciliation and the breaking down of walls of, uh, of uh, anti-Semitism, other things that have divided us, the removing of a stone of offense, but the whole process is going to end in an outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Jewish people. Zechariah speaks, and I will pour out on the, on, the spirit, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of supplication and prayer, and they will look on him whom they have pierced and mourn for him as an only son. Look on him whom they have pierced. That's only Yeshua, and mourn for him as, as an only son. That's going, that'll bring in national realization of who the Messiah is. In Israel, there's a great expectation and anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. Right throughout Israel, you see little flags in Hebrew, Messiah is coming, or just Messiah. It's amazing. You, but when they think of Messiah, they don't think that that Messiah is Yeshua. Uh, a few years ago, we were in Israel, and we were talking to this young guy, and I said, <coughs> he was about 17, and I said to him, we said to him, do you... Uh, What's it like being a teenager in Israel right now? Oh, it's great. We love being Israelis because we have a sense of purpose. We have a sense of destiny that few people have. And uh, it's, it's exciting to be in Israel. We have a wonderful sense of purpose. And I said, do you ever talk about the Messiah? And they said, all the time we talk about the Messiah and the coming of the Messiah. And this cool young teenager. And um, then I said, do you think there's any possibility that that Messiah could be Yeshua? And immediately his face darkened, and he said, oh no, absolutely not, because the Christian Messiah believes that all the, will, will take, uh, that all the Christians will be taken up into heaven and the Jews be punished. That's not our Messiah. <laughs> well, I said, we're sticking with you all the way through. <laughs> but. Uh, we have a, sometimes a distorted view of the Messiah, even in our tradition. So uh, now let's just look at a few verses concerning the Davidic covenant. Uh, first of all, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, because the beginning of the New Testament is, uh, is an announcement concerning the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. And so hidden, hidden behind the shrouds of Christian tradition, and uh, when the angel comes to Mary, uh, the angel says the following, uh, verse 30 of Luke chapter 1, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, Miriam, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb. You will bear a son. You shall call his name Yeshua. He shall be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Wow, <laughs> that is some announcement. But we lost that somewhere in the middle of our Hail Marys. <laughs> Excuse me, Catholics. And um, so, but we did, we lost it in tradition, lost in tradition, the sense of the destiny of history is propelling us towards the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Now, a few, a few more verses of the Davidic covenant. You'll find it in Psalm 89, 2 Chronicles 
and second and one chronicles uh, chapter uh, 17 and second samuel chapter 7 so i'm just going to one chronicles chapter 17 um Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep to be a prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And I will subdue all your enemies. Moreover, I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house when you and your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring after you. One of your own son, I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. That's what Mary was quoting. That's what the, what the, the angel was quoting to Mary. His throne, his dynasty will last forever. Now a house, a house is a dynastic rule. Uh, since 1066, there have been about six, or seven different dynasties in England, in, in England, I should say, rather than the United Kingdom. There have been about six or seven different dynasties with the Tudor, Tudors, the Stuarts, the Hanoverians, and so on. And uh, nobody could imagine that, this, for example, that the Tudor dynasty will one day be restored, right? Now, there hasn't been an occupant of the throne of David since the days of Zedekiah, around 580 BC. That's a long time. That throne of David has never been occupied by anybody in all those days. It was not restored when Ezra and Nehemiah came back to the land in the, in, after the 70-year period in Babylon. That throne was never res restored. You had Herod, a false king, calling himself the king of Israel, but he was a false king and wasn't from this th the uh, line of David. That throne has left, that dynasty has been left unclaimed. Can you imagine any dynasty neglected and fallen for 2,500 years? Not, and God says, I'm going to restore that dynasty. And one person, one person is going to rule over that uh, uh, house forever. Now, if that person is to rule forever, he must have immortality. And the psalm says he will not let his beloved know decay. He died, he was buried, but his body didn't experience decay because he rose. <laughs> <laughs> that the scriptures may be fulfilled. Figure that one out on BBC. Figure that one out in the humanist on CNN. You cannot. This is the plan and the word of the Lord. That the, the direction of history is moving inexorably towards the restoration of the throne of David. Now we see this also in one of the great uh, prophecies of regathering in the prophet Amos. And the last verses of the promise of prophet Amos and it speaks beautifully about the restoration of David's throne. In that day, just the last part of Amos, of Amos chapter 9, 9 11. In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Eden and all the nations that are called by name, my name. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow to it. I will restore the fortunes of the people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. That's what we see today. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them in their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord of hosts. There may be some people who are skeptical about the modern restoration of Israel and say, oh, well, it, the restoration of Israel might be another millennium away. This is a false restoration of Israel, their colonial, and all, uh, their colonial power. They're disrupting the Arab people. You hear this kind of stuff. But... Amos here speaks of a regathering to in the land, and one of the marks of the regathering, he mentions planting vineyards and drinking wine, and you think, well, Amos is some sort of an alcoholic or something, but he's speaking um, something very significant there that Amos couldn't have possibly known. 
in all those Muslim era, remember we spoke how Islam was under the Muslim rule from the seventh century, the mid 600s, all the way until World War I, when the Ottoman Empire fell, was dislodged, partly as a result of British influence. And in all those years, it was illegal to grow the vine the, in Israel. Isn't that amazing? So there was no grapes in Israel during the Muslim era. Illegal. <laughs> so it's a mark of the end, which uh, uh, Amos couldn't have possibly know that, an end of Islamic domination over Israel. Isn't that amazing? And so, it's not, uh, an, I'm not saying an end of Arab blessing in Israel, an end of Islamic domination over Israel, and then they would, and they'll never be uprooted again. And David, and this tabernacle of David will be restored. This is reinforcing that the whole process, just like Ezekiel saw them coming back, the dry bones, and then the breath coming into them, and David, my servant, shall be king over them. The future of the world is, is, is going to be wonderful. But before that, there's going to be lots of problems on the earth. And we read about, some, we see glimpses into this in an obscure fashion, cryptic fashion, in the book of Revelation. Now let me tell you, the book of Revelation is quite cryptic because it's visions that John saw and John himself may have not understood the full meaning of those visions. So if someone comes along, as we had this friend, he said, you know what, he said, here's my notes in the book of Revelation, you don't need to read anything else, this is it. <laughs> no, it's not like that. But we do, on the other hand, we don't have to be entirely skeptical of the book of Revelation. We do see some things. And I want to bring to your attention a few things from the book of Revelation that might be open your eyes. The, uh, I want to bring you to Revelation uh, chapter 9. In here in Revelation chapter 9, I was speaking about what's ahead for Israel. The regathering of Israel from the nations is going to keep on moving until they're filled with his spirit. As Zechariah says, they pour out the spirit of supplication. They will look in him whom they have pierced. They'll behold the Lamb of God, like John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, not just the sins of the world, but their sins. As John writes, he's the propitiation not only of our sins, but the sins of the whole world. So we'll be united by this thing, but through the blood made into one new man on the basis of the blood. By the way, our union with Israel is not on the basis of the, of the Jewish religion. Our union with Israel is on, on the basis of the promise, promises. We're grafted into the promises. We're grafted into the patriotic blessings. We're released from the curse and grafted into the blessings. We're grafted in from the ignorance and the paganism of the nations into the worship of the one true God. Like Ruth, who joined into the true God of Israel, your God shall be my God, your people my people. And you, she was grafted in by a, the grandfather, great-grandfather of King David, and um, he threw his mantle over us. Now, he was a, a Bethlehemite, and that same Yeshua has thrown his mantle over us. We're his roots, gathered from the nations. The bride, a Gentile bride, Ruth was a Gentile bride for Boaz, were gathered in and grafted in. And she said, your God shall be my God, your people my people. That's it. That's who we serve as Christians. We're grafted in. But Revelation chapter 9 speaks of uh, seven trumpets, right? And uh, beginning from verse 6, you have the first trumpet, the second trumpet, the third trumpet, the fourth trumpet. And in chapter 9, the fifth trumpet. Then in chapter 9, verse 12, then the sixth angel blew his trumpet. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, altar of God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for that hour, the day, the month, and the year, timing, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number, and this is how I saw the horses on, in my vision and those who rode them. They were, wore a horse plates and all of that. And the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of their works. That's the sixth trumpet. And the seventh trumpet, the Lord returns. Also, in Revelation 16, you see seven bowls of judgment. And the sixth one, the kings come from the river Euphrates. And the seventh one, it is finished. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Jesus will come at the last trump. 
Now, the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation, the sixth trumpet is the battle of Armageddon, and the seventh trumpet is the return of the Lord. The same with the six bowls of judgment. The sixth is something happening at the river Euphrates, and the seventh is the return of the Lord. The last event of history before the coming of the, the last event is the coming of the Lord, and he comes to take the throne of David. He comes to rule over the nations. He comes to fulfill what was prophesied by Isaiah chapter 2. And, the, it, it, and in cha Isaiah chapter 11, when the, the increase of his kingdom will be the, over the whole world, he'll reign over the whole world. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. They'll brief their, plows in, uh, their swords into pruning hooks. And nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. This terrible world of conflicts between nations, that whole order of things is about to come to an end. This, Asian, this era of national collision of nations is about to come to a rapid end. And the last great war will be the battle of Armageddon. He sees a beast rising from the Euphrates River. Now, in, in the 1930s, a beast rose in the middle of Europe uh, with, with uh, demonic power and fierceness. And that beast had, a, as a part of its agenda, a fierce hatred of the Jewish people. We know the story. And thankfully, that beast was defeated, largely as a result of the United Kingdom's efforts. That beast was a horrible beast, and enveloping so much of the earth in this uh, hatred towards Israel. Out of the depths of the worst that that beast could do to the Jewish people came forward the state of Israel. The... Um, Revelation sees one final beast, a beast coming from the Euphrates River. Remember, in the last days, it's, he sees something coming for the kings of the east at the Euphrates River, a confederacy of nations coming from the Euphrates River who are stopped at a place called Armageddon. And that the, we see today in Iran, he says also that beast will have the nature of a lion a bear and a leopard. And um, in, we see this in Revelation 13, verse 2. He saw beasts like a lion, like a bear, uh, like a leopard coming against Israel in Revelation chapter 13. He saw spirits like frogs going out to all nations, demons. These are demons inspired by the dragon. Now, the dragon is the devil. The devil is raising up anti-Semitism, and especially in these nations around the Euphrates River. We see today, since the Abrahamic Accords especially, we see that the southern Sahara, the, the, the southern uh, uh, Middle Eastern nations have become less hostile to Israel, and the northern Islamic nations, Iran, Syria, Afghanistan, and, uh, uh, and Turkey, becoming more hostile to Israel. The last event before the coming of the Lord is that the kings will come from the realm of the Euphrates River and they will be stopped <laughs> by the Lord at a place called Armageddon. He sees, uh, perhaps it's not too much conjecture to say that this final beast that's emerging today, similar to the way Hitler emerged in Central Europe in the 1930s, one more beast, by the way, in prophecy, a beast is always a nation or a confederacy of nations. And the beast that was like a lion, a, le a bear, and a leopard, in Daniel 7, 4 and 6, we see who these uh, beasts are. He sees that the lion was um, Babylon, the bear were the Medes and the Persians, and the leopard was Syria, back in Daniel. If the lion, the bear, and the leopard in the book of Revelation mean the same as the lion, the bear, and the leopard, in the book of Daniel, then it's clear that the lion, according to Daniel, the lion is Babylon, the bear of the Medes and the Persians, and the leopard is Syria. That's the residue of Alexander's empire. Alexander was like a leopard, and the residue of that is in Turkey and Syria. The residue of the lion is around Babylon, Iraq, and the residue of, of uh, the, the uh, lion, the bear is in Persia or Iran today.
That's amazing. A beast coming from that region. Because there's a lot of end time teaching. There's teaching the beast will be uh, the whole, all the nations of the world. No. The beast is confined to that one area. Now that may involve conflict in the whole world. And indeed we see alliances coming from Gog and Magog and possibly, which seem probably to be Russia and China coming into the scene. But keep your eye on Iran. Keep your eye on Syria. Keep your eye on Iraq. Um, in, Ze in Zechariah, he sees this in Zechariah chapter 5, there's the prophecy of a woman in a basket. Do you remember that one? And woman, the word woman in uh, Hebrew is very close to the word for fire, ish and isha. It's just a, a yard of a difference. And he sees a vision of fire inside of a ba basket, is not in the original Hebrew, container, bushel container. He sees fire in a container on the wings of a stork. And a place is found for that fire in a container, which is like a bomb to me, carried by the wings of a stork, like a plane, in the land of Shinar, which is western Iran or eastern Iraq. Either of those areas could be called Shinar. Watch out for this last beast. And it's an incredible thing that America tried to restrain Iran from getting nuclear power. Netanyahu did everything in his power to stop Iran getting nuclear power. But now you have a kind of a weakened presidency in America. Or if we have a president there at all. But it might be just a phone call or an avatar. It might be like ABBA. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, whatever, we have a weakened pre administration in America. And Iran are encountering no resistance. But he saw a place being made for that bomb, but what it looks like it to me, in Zechariah chapter 5. He sees a beast emerging from Iran, the Euphrates River area as the sixth trumpet. At the seventh trumpet, the Lord comes. What happens at the seventh trumpet? Look up. Our mortal will put on immortality. Then will come the redemption. We're coming, as David mentioned, for the hour of the redemption of the whole planet. This bondage to the cave, which holds us all, even we who have been liberated from the law of, of, the spirit, of, of sin and death by the law of the spirit of life, and that much of the law of sickness, but not all of the law of sickness. And so we have still some bondage to decay. Our mortal will put on immortality, will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. Not before the last trumpet, at the last trumpet, when we rise to meet him in the air. And this mortal will put on immortality, for he's, brought, he's bringing with him. He brought with him at the Passover, the redemption of our spirits. He brought with him in Pentecost, the redemption of our souls, the spirit leading us into all truth. And he's bringing with him at Tabernacles, the redemption of our bodies. This mortal must put on immortality. That's the destiny, destiny of each one of us. We shall be like him. Every thread of, of uh, corruption will be broken off morally, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. We'll be broken off our bodies at the return of the Lord. I can't wait for the Lord's return. And, but there are some bad things to happen before that happens. But our sh focus should not be on the bad things that must shortly come to pass, but on the things that will come to pass after the bad things. Just like the horrible beast that emerged in the 1930s came into full evidence in the 1940s and was cut off, this final beast will be cut off by the Lord himself, and he shall be king over all the earth. I'm going to read just now from uh, Zechariah. Zechariah, a few scriptures from Zechariah that I've mentioned a few times. I've mentioned but not quoted. Zechariah chapter 12. Behold, the day is coming for the Lord when the spoil shall be taken will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken, the houses plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go into exile but the rest of the people shall N not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights in the day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem at the east. Uh, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, uh, to east and west. And you shall, uh, on that day, living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half to the eastern sea and half to the western sea. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one, and his name will be one. Come and let us go into the mountain of the Lord, and he will teach us his ways. 
For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We're marching to Zion. We're marching into God's destiny for the world. Uh, Revelation sees Babylon falling. Revelation sees that which is based on human, purely human principles tumbling at the presence of the Lord. This same Jesus, who we've seen go, he's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. He's going to destroy the plots of the enemy against Israel, this pl the plots of the enemy ag against world peace. He's coming very, very shortly. The whole process of the regathering of Israel is the future propulsion of history according to the released word of God. The word of God has been released from its throne. It's unstoppable. It will achieve what it's accomplished. And the question is, are we in? We say, come me in, Lord. I can't wait when you remove all these beasts from the earth and you establish the beautiful kingdom of love and joy. And we'll, uh, it'll be a kingdom based on the, on, the new, on the new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. A people who are full of kindness. A people given to kindness, goodness, gentleness, service, peacefulness. The world will be repopulated and re-educated according to his ways. It's a beautiful destiny from the planet. Um, in those other trumpets that preceded the sixth trumpet, we see um, judgments coming on the rivers, judgments coming on the oceans. In other words, problems with the climate. Now, listening to the media, you th uh, we have a lot of information about global warming and all these problems. Actually, it's true. These are real, real problems on the earth. But it touches just a third of the rivers and a third of the seas. The world not, will not be destroyed by these things. Ultimately, the Lord will redeem us out of all those plagues and bondages coming very, very soon. The plagues revealed were the prelude to the uh, redemption that came through the blood brought them out of Egypt and the first establishment of, of Israel. And the second return made the way for the coming of the Messiah uh, uh, to be born in Bethlehem and bring in redemption for us all. And the third regathering of Israel, bring the way for the kingdom of God to be established outwardly upon this world. Three great movements that the Lord has moving today, according to Matthew 24 and Luke 21 that I've already quoted. There will be, and in Matthew 25, three great thrusts of the Spirit in these days. The release of this gospel of the kingdom, not a gospel of my denomination, it's better than your denomination, but the gospel of the kingdom of God that comes through repentance and cleansing through the blood and restoration to favor with God through the blood of Jesus and regeneration through the Spirit, and the gospel of his rule and his ways. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached to every nation. The Jews will be regathered to the, their land and the bride will be prepared. Matthew 25, the preparation of the bride. Those who love the Lord with all their hearts, those who put him first, those whose lives or swivel around the Lord and his agenda. See, there are Christians who have the Lord in their lives, and then the Christians whose lives are centered and built around him. Just like a couple may build their lives around their family, we also build our lives around him. And then within the context of that, we live out our family lives and our lives upon the earth. What a wonderful calling to see what we see and to be alive at this amazing climactic point of history. We're almost at the sixth trumpet. And the immediate, the last event before the coming of the Lord is the battle of Armageddon and the kingdoms coming, and the kings coming against Israel from the Euphrates River. The president of, Israel, uh, of Iran has said the number one goal of our nation is to destroy Israel. And even Hitler didn't say it that clearly. The number one goal of this nation is to destroy Israel and to make it cease from being a nation. Nula, would you share? We're talking about David taking the throne again, coming back to take the throne. And before he comes in the pattern of the feast, there's another day. And Jesus, I believe that's what he was talking about. He said, when you see these things and hear about these things, we're not to wring our hands in despair and talk about the negative. We're to look up, our redemption draws nigh. And the feast that we don't often mention is Yom Kippur. The Day of Atonement, there's a going to be a cleansing, and that's what God is doing. It's very confusing for many believers what is going on in the world today. But we're going through a, a cleansing, and God, that's what's going to happen when he uh, re re removes the veil from the eyes of Israel. They're going to look on him, and they're going to repent. So we, uh, it's an opportunity, because it, we always say about the Feast of Israel, the three factors. It points to something in Jewish history, and it points to the life of Yeshua 
and it's something that we have to walk out. It's not just something of history, something we know about in our heads. We have to live, but the fullness is Yeshua. In Colossians, it says that. And so they're a type and a shadow of a reality. So there's three factors. Paul said the three areas that the Lord is working on today, but there's three factors in our own walk. We have to live out these feasts. We have to understand the word of God. I used to read the Bible before I was born again as a history book. I loved history. And that was all about Jesus in the past, but not about me. And I discovered the word of God is not just history. The word of God is alive. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It tells us, that, and it cuts between soul and spirit. And I, I, uh, one man, I, he, he's since gone home to the Lord, I met when I first was born again. And he said, Nula, your spirit's okay, but there's a lot of mess in your soul. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I've learned about it since. And the Lord is still dealing with my soul and your soul, the flesh. We have to die to the flesh that the king can rule and reign, not just on the throne of David, but in our hearts, so that he can manifest himself as king and lord in your daily life. So the feasts are lived out in our bodies. We stand with Israel. We have our Pentecost experience, and we allow our bodies to be cleansed as we go through personal Yom Kippur, cleansing, removing of the veil from our eyes, not just from Israel's eyes, so that the king will be seen and sit on the throne of Israel. And Paul often says, you know, we know we're in the thing. The only thing we know, we'll be with him in Jerusalem. On the Mount of Olives, we're not sure whether we're coming this way or that way. <laughs> Amen. Um, Amen. And he wants you to rule and reign with him. For if the rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? What a wonderful day when he pours upon the spirit of supplication and prayer. And it's beginning to happen. It's beginning to happen thanks to your prayers and the works and labors of so many people. So count us in, Lord. Count us in. It hasn't yet appeared what we shall be like. But when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Lord, I thank you that there's a further transformation that you have in store for us, Lord. And, of, uh, and, and the, this planet will be released and redeemed itself. The whole creation is groaning, Lord. There's a groaning in the political order, a groaning in the social order, a groaning even in the creation itself, Lord. The bondage of pain, the suffering that even in the creation itself is undergoing is groaning and longing for you to come as our Redeemer. Lord, I thank you that this process, your word is being fulfilled and you're preparing the way for your return to this world. We say even so, come Lord Jesus and amplify your presence in each one of our lives. Reveal yourself to us, each one of us, more fully than we've ever known you before. May we love you more fully than we've ever loved you before. May we see you more clearly than we've ever seen you before. And may we follow you more closely than we've ever followed you before. We thank you, Lord, continue to break down that partition between uh, Israel and, Christ and the Christians and the Jews that tradition has built and unbelief has built and melt us all in your presence. Come, Lord, quick, speedily and work out your process in history and have mercy among every nation, even those nations who are in bondage or who are in, under the oppression of evil leaders. Father, bring forth the new day of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So thank you, everyone, for the welcome. Thank you, David and team, for inviting us here. It's a privilege being here. Wow. Well, Israel, the clock is ticking, and the clock is ticking for all of us, <laughs> literally, spiritually. You want to be ready when Jesus comes. You want to be ready to meet him when he comes again. I want to be there when his feet shall rend the mountain in twain. I want to see Jesus when he comes. So thank you all for coming. Thank you again, Paul and Nula. We bless you and all the team here at Millbrook. And again, please keep on praying for Pastor Mark that God just raises him up and gives him a full healing. And for those who are thinking of going to Israel, 
Well, do a little bit more than think. <laughs> and bless you. And we'll just ask now with the uh, worship team just to uh, close, bring this conference to a close. And if you want to come to any of the other conferences, it'd be lovely to see you. Keep in touch with us in the ways that we've said in our office and on our media. Lord Jesus, we thank you that, Lord, that there is a clock of eternity. Lord, and that, Lord, that this world, which just tells us everything's by chance, we know that there's a plan, a divine plan. There's a divine plan of the ages, and there's a personal and individual plan. And I pray for each man and woman here, Lord, that they will fulfill their days by, Lord, being in that individual and personal plan. And if we're in that plan, Lord, we know also then that we'll be in this corporate plan, which looks to Israel and lifts up our head as we've heard because our redemption draws nigh and our hearts just say, Maranatha, even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. <laughs>